Today, what we're going to talk about in this video is the molecular biology revolution. And this has completely changed how we do genetics in bacteria and all other organisms. One of the cornerstones of this has been DNA sequencing. Hopefully you watched the videos on DNA sequencing that I posted. There were three of them. If you haven't watched them, please go watch them now. But what you'll see in this graph is that over the last three decades, the amount of bases has gone from around a million back in 1980 to hundreds and of millions and billions of base pairs and you can see this this is a log scale and you see this linear increase in the amount of sequence and you see after about 2000 when we did the human genome we've started sequencing lots of other genomes and there's now thousands and thousands of whole genome sequences there's a huge amount of sequencing data that it's been generated let's see if you understood those sequencing videos and can compare them and think about what would be used to use best to use so we're gonna have as like this project that we're working on during this lecture and I'm going to ask you questions about the project as we go through and our goal is that we've isolated thermophilic bacterium bacillus badgeri that is able to degrade starch your research company has directed you to clone the amylase gene, the enzyme that degrades this starch, from this microorganism and then overexpress it because you're then going to use that as a product that you sell as a way of generating sugar from starch. First, you decide to sequence the bacterium's entire genome before cloning the gene. You need your results as quickly as possible. Which method would you use? The correct answer is probably a combination of B and C. Sanger sequencing is an older technology, it's slower, and you can't get near as much base pair information. Illumina sequencing and Oxford nanopore both are good methods, but a combination of the two. Illumina sequence gives you very short sequences that are accurate. Oxford nanopore gives you much longer sequences, it can be tens and thousands of bases that you can then put together into sequences. That's probably the best method to use. So it's a combination of B and C. You now have the sequence, but that doesn't tell us much. What we really want to know is the proteins the DNA sequence encodes. Sophisticated bioinformatic programs have been developed for analyzing DNA. The KBase project from the Department of Energy collects the best of these tools and makes it possible to create pipelines for analysis. One such program, RAS-TK, excels at finding genes in a sequence of DNA. So how do these programs work? First, remember that we know many of the rules of translation. We know all 20 codons. We know transcription, translation start and stop signals. We can very easily map these out. By the way, a predicted coding sequence is not really called a gene since we don't know for a fact it encodes a protein. Scientists call these predicted genes open reading frames and use the acronym ORFS. If you apply just the simple rules we have learned, there are too many random genes you get for a piece of DNA. You saw this when you did the central dogma assignment with ORF Finder. You get six different potential open reading frames, three in one strand, three in the other strand. So we need to add some extra helper rules. One of the most powerful of these rules is this. Each organism has a codon preference influenced by its GST content. For example, if you are a high GC microbe, you will use CCC and CCG to code for proline and have fewer CCU and CCA codons. Random DNA sequence will not do this, so you will only find it in true genes. By applying these rules, it is possible to find the best candidate, and further testing has shown that the predicted ORFs are over 95% accurate. The K-based program that predicts ORFs is called RAST-TK. It runs through a number of steps to determine the protein sequence. First, it will find all the tRNAs, rRNAs, CRISPR sequences, and phage. These have common conserved sequences that makes it easy to pick them up. Then it runs two programs 
to take different approaches to finding predicted ORFs. Typically, four to 8,000 for a typical genome. Now that we have the ORFs, and we are pretty confident that they really code for genes, we want to find out the function of all these proteins. Lucky for us, there is a huge amount of knowledge that scientists have accumulated over many decades about proteins, and this knowledge is all housed in the database, GenBank. We simply compare each ORF sequence to sequences in GenBank. If the ORF sequence is similar to a sequence in GenBank, it is likely has a similar function. The likelihood increases as the homology increases. Because the databases are getting so huge, most programs compare to a subset of GenBank proteins containing common representative sequences for each type of protein. A common program for doing these comparisons is BLAST, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. BLAST is an optimized search algorithm that is very fast at comparing sequences. BLAST results tell you how well your query matches the identified sequence. In this example, we have a perfect match for, to a protein in the database. The max score is the highest score possible from your sequence. The score increases for every match, but decreases for mismatches and if gaps appear in the sequence. The E-value estimates the chance that this match would appear randomly. And in this case, as you can see, it's zero. The percent identity indicates how many amino acids in the query are the same in the match sequence. In this case, it was 100% identical. A blast has to be run for every open reading frame. As you can imagine, this would quickly get tedious for a human. But programs have been written to blast every protein and an entire genome can be run in about five minutes. By doing a comparison of the open reading frame proteins to a known database of proteins, you can find that some pathways have all the enzymes represented. If it has all the enzymes, then it probably has that function. You can make predictions about the behavior of bacteria based upon these genes. What I'm showing you here is an annotation of Rhinobacter agricola. And I've gone through and I've run these things and I've done and annotated the assembly. And then we've run model characterization on it to build a model. Right? When we do that, what we find is the following. You can look at the pathways that it has and you can see which ones it is actually capable of clearing. So here's glycolysis, glycolysis and we can look at is it able to do that. You click on it and you see every blue box means that it has that enzyme. And for the majority of the enzymes, it has it. So we can make, be pretty confident in saying that this organism can carry out glycolysis. If we go back to the selection, we can look at the TCA cycle. And again, if you look at the TCA cycle and all the different enzymes, you see it has almost all the enzymes. Therefore, it's very likely that this organism has the TCA cycle. You can use a similar logic for all of this. Here are another examples of predictions you can make. Look at the transporters in Helobacter pylori. It also has the TCA cycle and ATP synthase, so it predicts that it probably is a respiratory organism. Also note the urease enzyme that will make ammonia and protect a microbe at a low pH of the stomach, and you can see that here. Okay, so let's put this knowledge to work. Now that you have the entire sequence, how could you determine the location of the amylase gene? All right, here's the answer. Number one, you can predict open reading frames using KBase in the program RASTK. Then you can determine functions with KBase programs such as build metabolic model. And then finally, you can search the metabolic model and see if there are any predicted amylase genes. So you can see, even from just the sequence, you can learn quite a bit. 
We now move to another phenomenon that has important biological implications. Mobile genetic elements. They also have uses in genetics research and is why I decided to talk about them here. Mobile genetic elements are sequences of DNA found in all organisms that are capable of hopping from one area of DNA to another. They can increase in number in the genome and are another form of selfish DNA. There are several different types and I will mention two. First, insertion sequences are mobile genetic elements that only code for functions for moving DNA. Second, transposons have all the functions of an insertion sequence, but also have useful genes for the host. One example is antibiotic resistance, and it's yet another way that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. In the context of genetics, mobile genetic elements cause mutations. The transposons used in laboratories are 700 to 10,000 base pairs long. An insertion of a transposon in the genome always causes a mutation in the gene into which they insert. They have transcription and translation stop sequences near their ends that stop any gene expression. They also have a selectable marker, often antibiotic resistance, so it's very easy to pick out mutants from a population. A big advantage of this type of mutagenesis is its safety. Transposons that infect bacteria cannot infect humans, so humans can safely use them and not worry about any kind of damage. One example construct used in research is PRL27. The transposase of PRL27 is outside of TN5. Once it is the transposon inserts in a genome, it cannot hop out again, and this makes it very stable because the transposase is in the plasmid, not in the transposon. These authors have created a mutant hypertransposase that has a much higher frequency of transposition, thus they get more mutants. The engineered transposon also encodes canamycin resistance, so it is selectable. The ORI R6K origin of the plasmid means it can only replicate in E. coli, Thus, if it is moved into another organism, it is a suicide plasmid and will not continue to replicate. The only way for the target organism to attain drug resistance is to have the transposon hop into the chromosome. Finally, it has an origin of transfer. And if you remember back to what we talked about in horizontal gene transfer, this allows it to be transferred to other bacteria, almost any gram-negative bacterium, if the TRA genes are encoded. And the TRA genes are encoded in the bacterial strains that will house this plasmid. Using this system, it is easy to create thousands of transposon mutants in any target bacterium and then easily select for them using canamycin drug resistance. Here's an example of a mutation protocol we use in Microbio 527 to cause mutations in a photosynthetic bacterium called Rhodospirillum rubrum a special E. coli strain that has the TRA functions in its chromosome and PRL27 is mixed with Rhodospirillum rubrum. While these two strains are together, the plasma is mated over to R. rubrum. After mating, the mixture is plated onto canamycin and plus naladistic acid plates. The naladistic acid antibiotic selects against the E. coli and because of the canamycin, only our rubrum that have the transposon inserted into its chromosome will survive. Thus, you get thousands of our rubrum mutants from a very simple experiment. Once you have these mutants, you can then do screens on various plates, looking for lack of growth. For example, for nutritional mutants, you do the original selection for the transposon on a rich medium. You then screen on plates that contain a mineral medium and look for the absence of growth. For photopigment mutants, you look for colony colors that are different than wild type. Our rubrum is a dark red color. For photosynthetic minus mutants, you screen for mutants by growing under photosynthetic conditions and look for deficiencies. As you can see, transposon mutagenesis can be a powerful way of finding interesting mutants. 
You now want to verify that the candidate gene you identified actually does encode an amylase gene. You expose the strain to a transposon containing acanamycin drug resistance. Plate the resulting culture on a rich medium plus canamycin. Is this a selection or a screen? What must every microbe have that grows on the plate? Finally, you replicate a plate to a medium that has starch as the only carbon source. You look for microbes that cannot grow. Is this a selection or a screen? Okay, the answer to 11 is it is a selection because you're selecting for cannabis and drug resistance. The answer to 12 is anything that has that drug resistance must have a transposon. And the answer to 13 is it's a screen. <clears throat> okay, now we're moving on to talk about CRISPR systems. DNA sequencing became accessible to many research labs in the 1980s, and scientists began to sequence all sorts of DNA. In 1987, researchers in Japan reported the sequencing of the alkaline phosphatase gene of E. coli. The paper by Ishino et al., its main focus was to sequence the gene and describe its expression. However, in a final paragraph, they described an unusual region that contained five homologous sequences of 29 base pairs with spacers of 32 base pairs. It was not clear to the researchers what the significance of this sequence was, but they reported the observation. In the next 13 years, as more DNA was sequenced, this unusual pattern of DNA sequence appeared in numerous bacteria, archaea, and even in the mitochondria of some organisms. And the name CRISPR was coined for these clustered, regular, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. More investigations showed there was transcription from these regions and that there were CRISPR-associated genes, CAS, that coded for proteins that were all synthesized at the same time from one messenger RNA. Some of these proteins cut DNA and others wound it up. With more experimentation, researchers discovered that these systems were another form of immunity that protected the bacteria against viruses and other forms of parasitic DNA. The system is slightly different in various bacteria. Here we describe the system used by Streptococcus thermophilus, an organism used extensively in the dairy industry for yogurt production. When a virus infects a host bacterium, it is attacked by restriction enzymes or by CRISPR. If they are successful in repelling the virus, the CRISPR system saves a piece of the DNA by adding it to a CRISPR repeat spacer array, shown in A. These were the sequences that Ishino found. This section of DNA is transcribed into RNA, digested into individual pieces, and each piece associates with a protein called Cas9, which means CRISPR-associated protein 9. Cas9 is a nuclease, and the RNA that it binds guides it to the DNA to attack by hybridizing to it, in this case, viral DNA. If that viral DNA ever enters the cell again, the Cas9 protein recognizes it and cleaves it. This system is potent. It's a kind of adaptive immunity for the bacterium because it can remember any virus or other DNA that ever attacked it. This immunity to viruses is all well and good. But the story gets interesting when scientists realized that CRISPR-Cas9 could edit a genome. In 2013, a set of landmark papers by Feng Zhang and George Church simultaneously demonstrated that CRISPR could target almost any sequence using Cas9 and appropriately designed RNA. Subsequent work has shown the system is functional in many different organisms from bacteria to humans. Three components are needed the Cas9 protein, the RNA, and a separate DNA template that encodes the desired change to the region and has homology arms to the targeted region. This last thing provides a material to help in the repair of the DNA. In eukaryotic systems, the double-stranded breaks made by CRISPR are fixed by homology-directed repair, which grabs the DNA template and combines it into the genome to fix it. In bacteria, you also need a recombination system repair the damage Cas9 makes as there is not an active homology directed repair system. In all organisms, this DNA template can have anything you want in that piece 
as long as part of it is homologous to the original DNA area. The power of this system is in its high frequency. Previous methods, such as cloning DNA, manipulating it in a test tube, and then moving it back into an organism, happen at a very low frequency due to low rates of DNA transformation and low rates of DNA recombination. You need a powerful selection, such as drug resistance, to find the rare cell that has taken up the DNA and inserted it into the genome. With CRISPR systems, a selection is not necessary. You can pick a handful of candidates that survive the procedure and look for the region you want. Often, more than half of them will have the desired genetic makeup. This much higher frequency makes genetic manipulation simpler and faster. The possibilities are truly endless. Some of my students have reported work in their research labs where they use CRISPR to investigate genetic defects in human hearts, breast cancer, and underlying processes in the development using zebrafish. CRISPR is a revolutionary method and will change science, medicine, and the human race. It is now possible to easily edit any genome from a simple bacterium to a human genome. It is analogous to having the cut and paste capability of a word processor, but for DNA genome. Given what we just talked about, can you think of an easier way to demonstrate the function of the candidate amylase gene? And of course, the correct answer is you can just mutate anything that you think is an amylase with CRISPR and see if it loses amylase activity. I hope you watched the movie on PCR. What I'm showing here on this slide is something that you really need that background. So what it is, is scientists have used PCR to make a special type of cloning and cloning is called circular polymerase extension cloning of complex genes or CPEC. In spe this special type of cloning, you design a PCR such that it has overlapping ends with a target plasmid. The primers that you use have overhangs that contain an identical sequence to a plasmid. The amplified target sequence in orange is mixed with the plasmid because both fragments have compatible ends one, a subsequent PCR, in a subsequent re PCR reaction, the target sequence gets incorporated into the vector. After the second PCR, the now intact plasmid is transformed into chemically competent E. coli. This diagram was taken from Quan and Tian, a paper in 2009, and it's very easy to do. This type of CPEC cloning, you can clone any section of DNA that you want. You just have to know the sequence. So if you use these uh, protein expression systems, there's four major systems. There's one in bacteria uh, in E. coli. Uh, sometimes eukaryotic proteins do not express well. Eukaryotic genes do not express well in, the, in E. coli-based systems. So there's a number of systems that have been developed in eukaryotes. Uh, there's one in yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There's insect cells and there's mammalian cells. Here is an example of an E. coli expression vector, and you'll have a pro promoter, you'll have the shindell garnell sequence, you'll have these tags, and you can use these tags to purify the protein. And then you'll have the fusion protein in here, and then you'll have a repressor. And the repressor is often the lack repressor and a promoter operator system that you can shut down this promoter here with this repressor, and it prevents uh, unwanted transcription. So normally you'll grow the strain up to a high population and then you'll put in conditions that relax the repressor, turn on expression from the promoter here, and you get you know, huge amounts of protein expressed. These tags, the, an N-terminal, C-terminal tag, these tags can often be used to easily purify the proteins and makes many of the purification protocols just one-step protocols to purify the protein. I won't go into the details of this, but you're interested. They're called histag proteins, and you can look it up. Okay, finally, you want to clone the gene. So you now have found your amylase gene. What is the most efficient way to do this? 
how could you make a large amount of this protein? First, what you do is you create primers that flank the region, this amylase gene that you found. You would then run PCR to amplify the fragment, and then you'd use topo cloning to place the fragment into an expression vector. And lastly, you grow up a large amount of this culture and turn on expression of this by relaxing the promoter, you know, relaxing the repressor. We've talked a lot about genetics and genomics, and these technologies have been used to generate all sorts of useful products in modern society. One we talked about before is GMA, GMO crops, genetically modified crops. They give a resistance to Roundup. It's also been used in the curing of certain genetic diseases. You can express all sorts of proteins using these systems, polymerases, uh, research substrates, restriction enzymes. There's th therapeutics such as insulin, human growth hormone. In detergents, they actually isolate enzymes that way. Now this doesn't use cloning, but lots of enzymes have alkaline phosphatases and proteases in them, and the, that makes these detergents work better. The sequencing had, can, is really revolutionizing things. It will be true soon that you will be able to, as part of your doctor's visit, they will do a blood test, they will sequence your whole genome, and then they will be able to this diagnose and say, well, given your genome, you will have more trouble with heart disease. And then there's different modifications you can use in your diet to help with this. There's also been some interesting projects coming forward. One of them was Ubiome, which was kind of pop culture nonsense. And in that case, they were give, determining people's microbiomes and then making a bunch of dubious predictions about what that means. Another one that really isn't nonsense is the American Gut Project, where they're actually, anybody can send in a sample, they will then sequence it and tell you what's in your gut microbiome. And they're using this for comparative studies that are actually legitimate. So there's some stuff that's going on that's nonsense. In fact, Ubiome has now filed for bankruptcy. And then there's the American Gut Project, which I think is legitimate and interesting. And of course, lots of this stuff is used as tools in research. The last thing I want to say is CRISPR is a brave new world. There's great potential to treat genetic diseases, uh, diabetes. There's potentials to use it to shut down cancer cells. May, might be able to cure HIV, maybe eliminate, eliminate Huntington's disease. But there's also great potential for abuse. Any gene can be edited, and a great example are the CRISPR twins in China. In the process of in vitro fertilization, a scientist, which I refuse to name, engineered two twins to make them resistant to HIV by using CRISPR. This is really dangerous because uh, there's a potential for off-site mutations. And in fact, uh, there was recently a paper in Nature that claimed that there were lots of off-site mutations, but then they've had to retract that because of flaws in their design. But again, uh, other people have done other studies that have shown that maybe there are really are offsite mutations. This is a new technology. We really need to learn how, what it's going to be do, what, how many offsite mutations there are, what the risks are before we start applying this to humans. And then there's idiots like biohackers that are actually trying to use uh, CRISPR when they don't really understand what they're doing. One of the developers of this technology, Professor Jennifer Dwidna, has called for a public consensus because she can see the dangers of this technology. One of the things that you should think about is where do you think we should draw the lines? What, what, what do you think it's appropriate to use for and what is it not? In any case, we need to slow down, perfect this technology, and create some rules.